Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Let's try this one more time. I wasn't even paying attention. I need to get rid of my old YouTube channel, so I always am on this one. Sometimes I, I don't pay attention, and I wind up on the wrong channel. I thank you for bearing with me. But for those of you who were here earlier, I'm going to repeat what I said a little bit. First of all, welcome, you imagination connoisseurs and you members of this, the geek the post geek singularity community for this Rob observations live chat number 116. So let me first of all explain what I was doing tonight yet again. So tonight was what they called Warner Brothers and Legendary Pictures put on what was known as or what was called a fan screening event, which I really wasn't aware of. I didn't know what was going on. I wasn't paying attention. I've been so busy uh both working on the YouTube channel, but also finishing up Tango Shalom. You, we, we finished color grading the film this week, and I'm the post-supervisor. In addition to being a producer on the film and the editor, I'm also the post-supervisor. A lot of work to get done. So I didn't really know there was a fan event. The premiere of the film is, is not for, I think, we're over a week out. Well, Mike Doherty himself, the director of the film, who I've known for about 20 years, He's been contacting me periodically as he's come up for air working on the film because he knows I am a, a huge, unapologetic geek. I mean, I've been a geek my whole life. I've never apologized for it. Perhaps my fandom has sometimes gotten in the way of my professional career. I'd like to think not, but I know that's true. It, it has. But he knows that I am an, uh, my opinion is, is unfiltered. And so tonight... Legendary Pictures and Warner Brothers had a, a an event, big event, at the Arclight Cinemas where they have a giant, I guess it's an inflatable Godzilla on the roof of the Cinerama Dome, and they were having a lighting ceremony. They were going to light it up, and then they were going to show the film to fans. And before the movie, before the lighting ceremony, uh, Warner Brothers and Legendary threw what they were calling an influencers party. And, you know, over the last couple months, Mike has been periodically texting me because he knows that I'm uh, I am I'm a shameless Godzilla and Kaiju fan. And and he he wanted me. Uh, he wa we, were, we were talking about monsters and he's been working on this movie for three and a half years. And I think he just wanted to talk to a fan that had no agenda. Like when I'm talking to Mike Doherty, he knows I'm not trying to get a job. <laughs> you know, I, and people sometimes ask, well, with all the people, you know. How come you don't you don't work on their projects? Well, the reason I'm friends with them is because I'm not asking for jobs. But Mike and I, um, first of all, I have to say, and I, I for those of you who were here before, I apologize, but I first became aware of Mike Doherty because of his illustration, because of his artwork. And I used to see greeting cards that he had done the artwork for at a Los Angeles bookstore called Dark Delicacies. And strangely enough, Dark Delicacies had a reopening ceremony tonight that I was going to go to, but two days ago on Wednesday, Mike texted me and he said, hey man, how would you like to go see Godzilla Friday night? And I was like, would I? But so at Dark Delicacies, there was a there was an image that he had painted that was on a, 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 a greeting card that I loved. It was a Halloween themed greeting card. And after we became friends, I, you know, I told him, I said, hey, I I really love this image, and he actually made a print of it, and I'm going to show it to you. I uh, I had it framed once, and I I don't like the frame, but I'm I'm going to get this done. And this is one of my favorite images that anyone has ever created for Halloween. And that's it. And as you can see, uh, Mike signed it. It's one of it's number two of a hundred. And no, before anybody asks, I will never part with this image. But anyway, so so Mike had made that for me and of course Mike wrote a uh, co-wrote along with Mike uh, Dan Harris wrote X-Men 2 and Superman Returns, both of which I worked on as a documentarian. I did all the special features along with a Parker who was editing those special features for X-Men 2 and then I also was in Australia for a year on Superman Returns. And if you get the Blu-ray for that, you can watch a three-hour documentary I made called Requiem for Krypton, Making Superman Returns. And what's interesting is Mike Doherty's first feature that he directed and wrote, Trick or Treat, which was based on his character Sam, that he developed over uh, over time. And, 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 and really, it's gen it, that character's genesis was in these the artwork that he had done. He made Trick or Treat, which came out a week 
after a film I produced called The Hills Run Red a decade ago. Uh, they both came out in September of 2009. So, you know, my history with Mike is is long, and I've always admired him. I've always I've always liked him very much. And watching his career, his his career, he's, he directed Trick or Treat, which is very much a labor of love. He directed Krampus, and now he's graduated to making a giant kaiju extravaganza. Now, here's the thing. Now, I gotta, I, I, I you before I I get into what I thought of Godzilla, King of the Monsters. But you know what? I know you guys all want to hear it. I know you here. Here was basically what I tweeted. Here's my review. And I don't know. I went to this influencers party that Mike, Mike invited me to this party tonight that was before this lighting ceremony that was in Hollywood where they lit up the dome. And and I asked people, I said, is there is there a social media embargo? And I was told it was lifted today at 5 p.m. Then I said, is there a review embargo? I mean, am I getting in trouble now that I've, well, I've been on YouTube for four years reviewing movies, but that's not my job. You know, I, I sometimes review films and on my own channel here on Rob's Observations and on the Burnett Network, I'm not a reviewer. I'm just a film pundit. So right away, I, I don't know if I'm breaking the review embargo. I am not going to review. I'm not going to give you a detailed review of Godzilla, King of the Monsters. I'm going to talk about my impressions of the film but I won't review it. I will tell you what I tweeted about the film after I got out of the, uh, out of the movie. I tweeted that I felt that Godzilla King of the Monsters, watching Godzilla King of the Monsters, was as if my eight-year-old inner child snorted a mountain of cocaine, Tony Montana style, and that I loved it 3,000. So make of that what you will. I stand by that. I have always loved Japanese science fiction. I've always loved movies like The Green Slime, Matango, you know, The Mushroom People. I've loved Gorath, which was The Wandering Earth before The Wandering Earth was on Netflix this week. Uh, you know, I've loved the the Mister or the Mysterians. Pardon me, the Mysterians is Captain Scarlet, it's Jerry Anderson, but the Mysterians. You know, I I my favorite kaiju film when I was a kid was Rodan, the first Rodan, which I still think to this day is a, a terrific movie. It's a scary film. It's different than you might think. It's a very serious movie. Like the first Godzilla movie was very serious. Now, growing up in Seattle, Washington, I watched all these movies on Channel 11 at 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoons on Sci-Fi Theater. That's where I fell in love with George Powell movies, Conquest of Space. They didn't really show Destination Moon, but they showed Conquest of Space, War of the Worlds, which was like my favorite movie when I was five, and uh, When Worlds Collide. And they would show Godzilla movies. And the movies that I would see the most, they showed, for whatever reason, Rodan. They also showed Godzilla versus Megalon a lot with Jet Jaguar. And they showed Godzilla's Revenge with Minya and the other monsters, which is kind of an amount. It's a clip show, if you are familiar with the Toho monster films. And my favorite Godzilla movie, my favorite and my absolute favorite Godzilla movie was Godzilla versus Monster Zero. Even more than I love Destroy All Monsters, Godzilla vs. Monster Zero, it, to me, it reminded me, the plot of the movie is basically aliens from Planet 10, who, by the way, are awesome. They ask Earth if they can borrow Godzilla and Rodan to get rid of their King Ghidorah problem. <laughs> and it's a ruse. Spoiler alert. They don't really want to get rid of their Ghidorah problem. They want to brainwash Godzilla and Rodan and launch all three monsters in their as their beachhead to invade the Earth. If you haven't seen Godzilla vs. Uh, Monster Zero, or as it's known, Godzilla vs. or Invasion of the Astro Monster, there is a, a great DVD of it that you can get that has both versions, the Japanese subtitled version and the American version, but... You, to watch that movie is one to love King Ghidorah, Ghidorah, and and or Ghidra, but Ghidorah, and also it's to love any alien race that looks like Asians in cool silver and black outfits with those thin black sunglasses. I mean, the controller in from Planet X, Planet Ten, I guess, 
is one of the great <laughs> the great evil villains of all time at least in my mind and if you if you're a fan of old science fiction if you love forbidden planet there's some beautiful painted backdrops and there's some incredible special effects in Godzilla versus Monster Zero. So anyway, that's where I'm coming from. Now there's a thing that I've I've often talked about uh, about Asian science fiction that we don't really have in America. And for lack of a better term, I call it whimsy. There is a there there and and normally for all of you who watch this channel I'm always talking about verisimilitude and suspension of disbelief and how that's very important when you're creating science fiction, fantasy, and horror television and, and movies. That you, you have to create a world and set up the rules of that world and adhere to them. Otherwise, you'll lose people. People get bored. Things get murky. It doesn't work. And I know people are like, well, Rob, how, how can you like Asian, especially Japanese sci-fi, and kaiju monsters, giant monsters, when there is there is no verisimilitude at all. Creatures that size could never exist physically in the real world. Well, to a certain extent, I'm a big fan of whimsy when it's presented correctly. And I would say Amelie, which of course anyone who watches my channel knows I went and saw at the American Cinematheque last weekend with my girlfriend Elizabeth. Because Jean-Pierre Genet, the director, was there and we wanted to get our French Amelie poster signed by him, which we did. But there is a certain whimsy that that is inherent to Asian cultures. I don't presume to understand why it's there because I've never lived in an Asian culture. I don't speak the language. But I've recognized it and it's something I love. And I was, I was talking about the animation works of Matsumoto Leje, Leje Matsumoto, who developed things like Star Blazers and Galaxy Express 999, which, by the way, the two Galaxy Express uh, feature films were released on Blu-ray last month, and they're beautiful. But, or a Queen Emeraldus, or Captain Harlock, and Queen Emeraldus has a dirigible, a space-going dirigible. But what Matsumoto Leje, or Leje Matsumoto, would do was, like, with Galaxy Express 999, he puts a, a, a 999, yes, he puts a train in space. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Uh, Star Blazers or, or Space Battleship Yamato, the, the battleship Yamato, the, the biggest battleship that Japan had in World War II, which was sunk by an American torpedo in Star Blazers or Space Battleship Yamato. Or now, if you haven't seen it, if you want to see some killer modern Japanese anime, you must check out Space Battleship Yamato 2199 and the new series, 2202, which is a retelling of the Common Empire story. If you like Star Blazers when you were a kid, they're so great. And the first half of the 2202 series has been released on Blu-ray. It just came out. It's fantastic. But who would have thought about putting a, a battleship, turning it into a spaceship and putting it into outer space and making it the hero of the series the same way the Starship Enterprise is heroic like in Star Trek. So here's the thing. Japanese sci-fi has a lot of this kind of whimsy. And I know people are like, well, Rob, how do you like this stuff? And you're always railing about verisimilitude. Well, if you know what you're making ha is whimsical, then I will go with that because as I'm also, also always talking about, author's intent. What were they going for? And the idea of these giant monsters, kaiju monsters, which couldn't possibly exist in the real, real world. But if you go with them, and these movies were made with such conviction. And of course, there's there's different continuities. What there's three different Godzilla continuities. And if you I understand, if you go with them, like when they did Godzilla 85 and later Godzilla versus Biollante, and they went into Godzilla versus Mothra and Godzilla GMK, all out monsters attack, and all the way up to Shin Godzilla, you've got the the modern Godzilla continuities, the millennium films. I mean, it's it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting thing. Now, if you like those movies, which I have my whole life, I've liked them, that when they try and bring these movies to America, when they're trying to make giant monster films in the United States, it's very, very difficult because we as Americans, we have no whimsy. It doesn't work for us. I mean, our myths, American myths, the Old West, for instance, the frontier, which is you know, our, uh, our myths. Like we don't have, what, uh, I'll give you another example. 
I was talking the other day about the ring and Sadako or Sumara. And, and the thing about Asian ghost stories in Asia, you're always going to temples and praying to, to your ancestors because your ancestors are up there and they're watching you. And if you fuck up, they'll get you. If you do something bad, those ghosts will come and tear your soul apart and not in a Cenobite Hellraiser way. It'll be a much more pain. Well, no, probably just, a, but just different. And it, because they know that it's part of, it's ingrained in their culture. You're in, in America. We like want we want to be in, in Judeo Christian culture. We want to be absolved of our sins. I mean, if you're, if you're a Christian, you believe in Christ, you get absolved of your sins. If you're a Jew like I am, once a year during the Day of Atonement, you you stand before God, you admit what you've done for the year, and you're not let off the hook. But because you admit it, you know, before God, it's, it's, it's all right. That's what you have to do. So anyway, different thing. And it, it permeates their pop culture. It really does. I mean, Japan, where kaiju monsters come from, has a very different outlook on certain things than we, of course, here in the West do. But what's great is, is that it, that that point of view that's different than Western points of view, especially Western science fiction, which is very much reality-based, um, it's different. And they can have giant monsters. Like, there's a reason why Americans did not come up with... We came up with King Kong, who was essentially a pretty big ape, but his dimensions were not whimsically big, <laughs> I would say. You know, it, it, whereas Godzilla's 300 feet tall, Kong's like what, 50 feet tall or something? Now he's getting bigger in the legendary in, in the legendary universe. So so it's a it's a whole thing. So when I go see a kaiju movie, when I saw Godzilla, Roland Emmerich's 1998 Godzilla, the, the, there was no whimsy in it. It was just cheesy comedy, which I was disappointed by because I loved Independence Day. I think Independence Day is the greatest movie ever made about giant spaceships coming to Earth and blowing shit up. Independence Day, I, I loved for what it was because the characters were earnest. They were they were they were emulating the seventies, the Irwin Allen towering inferno disaster earthquake. He didn't make Earthquake, but but the that that disaster movie formula. And I loved Independence Day. I that's why I was excited for their Godzilla, Dean Devlin, Rolling Emmerich's Godzilla. But their humor, they didn't ground the movie enough. It felt like it was taking place in movie world. I didn't like their take on the Godzilla creature. There's a reason why in Godzilla Final Wars, there's this great scene where they kind of bring back the aliens from Planet X from Godzilla versus Monster Zero, and and they they actually have our CG American Godzilla fighting a man in suit Godzilla in Sydney, Australia, and of course the man in suit Godzilla, they literally a man in suit fights our CG Godzilla and kicks its ass, and 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 in my uh, if I remember correctly, the the alien from Planet X, the controller says. I knew that salmon eating iguana was no good or something to that effect, which I loved. So anyway, when I saw uh, 2014's Godzilla, you know, they, they really tried, they tried to have it two ways. They tried to make it really serious. And they, every time you were about to see Godzilla, like a shelter door would shut. They were afraid. It was like they, they tried to make it serious and give it, they, given an American bent. Let's make Godzilla believable. But you can't. Inherently, the whole concept of kaiju, of, of these giant monsters, has an element of whimsy that you can't escape from. You can't. So if you're going to make a movie like this in America, Guillermo del Toro, I am an unabashed lover of Pacific Rim. Is Pacific Rim perfect? No. But I loved it because, again, Guillermo del Toro, as also a lover of kaiju and monsters, he knew what he was doing. Authorship. He knew exactly what he was doing. The idea of Jaegers as a machine, these giant 300-foot-tall robots, this could never work. You could never move things. You could certainly never fight or throw punches, even if they were rocket-assisted punches. But if you go with it, it was so earnest in telling that if you've 
if you buy into that world, and I, I think a lot of people reject Pacific Rim. People are like, oh, it was even a Top Gun ripoff. To even compare it to Top Gun misses the point. So I'm not talking about Pacific Rim Uprising. I'm talking about the first Pacific Rim. I loved it. You know, I wanted, I was bummed out that the Chinese triplets, we didn't get to see them battle. They were taken out too quickly. It, it's not a movie without its faults. But when the giant kaiju picks up dip, get Gypsy Danger and sprouts its wings, I was like a little kid in a candy store. I saw that movie in a special screening that Guillermo del Toro was at four months before it opened, and I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Which brings me to Godzilla, King of the Monsters. You're all going... Dude, it's almost one o'clock in the morning. What the hell did you think of this movie? Well, like I told you, uh, my inner eight-year-old child, which still exists right here, I carry him with me every day. It was like if my inner eight-year-old child was snorting a mountain of Tony Montana's cocaine. Now, if you can, if you can grapple with that, <laughs> that's what it was like. I loved this movie because this movie embraced whimsy. It understood what it was, yet it had elements of so many other blockbuster films. And, and there's a lot of people that are just not going to buy into this movie. You, 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 going in, if you love the idea of giant monsters, and you, uh, and to be honest, even though the first Godzilla film in their, their, because this is part of a franchise, this is the third movie in Legendary and Warner Brothers monster kaiju franchise. The first was Godzilla 2014. The next was Kong Skull Island. And now this, Godzilla King of the Monsters. And they're now going to make King Kong versus Godzilla, which, by the way, are Godzilla versus Kong, whatever they're going to call it. Which, by the way, that was done in the 60s too. Toho made a Godzilla versus King Kong movie, actually two, and uh, kind of goofy, but uh, fun. So it's not unprecedented in Hollywood history. But this film. It, it was like watching a Japanese-made Godzilla movie. With, with and, and Asian science fiction is, is very melodramatic. This has melodrama in it. It has, it has family melodrama in it. It also has a diehard-esque villain, which I, 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 I... The plot of this movie had unexpected twists that I didn't expect to see. And then... They, once again, like a lot of the Godzilla movies do, like watching Godzilla GMK, All Out Monsters Attack, they sort of redefine the mythos. And this film is all about defining the mythology of the monsters. And I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. I love this movie. I, I mean, I can't... Uh, as somebody who loves his kaiju films, you know, who's loved... This was the kind of movie, if I saw this movie, look, I'm seeing this movie now as a middle-aged man on the cusp of another birthday. I'm that much closer to death. And the fact that I can watch this movie, I, uh, from the beginning of this movie, I was all in. A and first of all, can I just talk about the sound mix? They played this movie so loud. It was like, you know what? You know what I would equate this to? Let me give you a concert. Uh, I don't know what you'd call it, but my first rock concert was in 1979. I went and saw Kiss. <laughs> they were on the Destroyer tour. And I went with my my good friend Jeff Swafford and, and Pam Comstock, seventh grade, coolest girl I knew. She was a rock and roller, beautiful blonde. And my friend Jeff, oldest friend in the world at the time. I've known him since I was two. We go to see Kiss. Full makeup, full on Kiss show. You know, I want to say that that They'd even they'd even recorded "I Was Made for Loving You," which is sort of Kiss goes into the disco world. It didn't matter. This movie was like when I saw that Kiss concert. It was my first rock concert. It was loud. It was full of effects. Gene Simmons, the band, Ace Frehley, Peter Chris, Paul Stanley, full on makeup. The full on classic Chris, classic Kiss before they dropped the makeup and changed the lineup. But it was it was and for me. It was everything that I'd wanted from a rock concert, like everything I dreamed a rock concert could be. This is peak kaiju. I mean, if you want to see crazy technology, if you want to see, I, I mean, this, and uh, and by the way, they created the monarch mythology was taken to the, the nth degree. 
there's going to be a lot of people that just can't can't hang. <laughs> this is not their vibe, you know. I, I and I get it. I totally understand. But for me, as a lifelong lover of the of this genre, I, I Elizabeth will tell you I was hooting and hollering. I was laughing with delight at what Mike Doherty was doing. First of all, this this movie moves like a gunshot. It's paced. It's paced like you're trying to outrun a bullet. It's that fast. And and in a way, sometimes maybe it's too fast, but but it was so wildly entertaining the way that I don't know, a great amusement park ride is. It was so well designed and Mike also wrote the script. You know, he wrote X-Men 2 and he wrote Superman returns and this again it comes back down to authorship knowing what it is you're you're making and whereas godzilla 2014 tried to be self it was too self-important for me not enough godzilla although you had gratifying moments ripping the muto open and just blasting this movie it was so it was so exactly what i wanted it to be like I, I i wasn't let down by it i i it was so even even the end credits the music bear mccrary did the music and the the sound design it was so loud in the theater and the music it was so awesome and i was telling i was telling elizabeth the only thing that i disliked about this movie uh has something to do with the relationship between mothra and rodan <laughs> and, and I'm talking about a relationship between Mosura and Rodan, only because I love Mosura and Rodan. And there's even they even pay homage to Mosura and Mothra. Like you'll see, you'll get it. If you're a fan of these movies, this movie is going to leave you. Your face is going to be ruddy. You won't even have to drink anything. I didn't even have any Jameson before I saw this movie. And and I, I, I was drunk with delight. And I, I can't even begin to tell you. And again, maybe I'm violating. I'm, I'm not supposed to review. I'm not going to review the film. I'm just giving you my impressions. I had so much fun with this movie because it was it knew what it was. You know, unlike, say, Star Trek Discovery which doesn't know what it's supposed to be. As a matter of fact, I don't think modern Star Trek for the last 10 years has known what it's supposed to be. And it makes me, it makes my gums bleed. And I, when I watch things that I have loved for so long and, and the people that are now working on them keep trying to make them into something they're not, I'm going to make it better. It makes me want to stick a spoon in my eyeball, scoop it out and eat it. I can't stand that. But when... A guy like Mike Doherty, as a matter of fact, who has whimsy. He has that whimsy in his horror, in his sensibility. He also has the soul of an animator, which I I don't I don't have. And so I admire when people when people do have those things. So to watch a movie like this, where the creator, where Mike Doherty knows exactly what he wanted to make, and the studio let him. Like, I can't even imagine what it was like to watch these dailies come in. Because as many people know, I worked in feature production at Warner Brothers uh, in the beginning of my career. And the executives at the time, before they had the internet, would have to go after lunch and sit from like uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 4 o'clock in the afternoon and watch all the dailies that came in overnight for the films that Warner Brothers was making. And they would know what was happening all the time. Every day they would see how a film was developing. And I can't imagine what it was like either the executives who knew what they were doing like uh, alex garcia who used to work with brian singer who was one of the producers on this film alex garcia has been with legendary he moved over from working for brian singer at bad hat harry he moved over to legendary i think he's been there now for a decade maybe more uh was a producer on this film alex garcia knows what's up <laughs> he knows what's up and so does mike doherty and I feel that the producers and Mike as the director and the writer, co-writer of this film gave me everything I've ever wanted to see. They took what I wanted out of an American kaiju movie and they just, it was, it was unfettered creativity. And, and it, there was no, 
<laughs> there was no people going, well, we have to we have to pull back the reins and, and make this more palatable and realistic for our audiences. It's like, no, no, you're making a kaiju movie. You're making a giant monsters movie that you want to see monsters just as Joe Bob Briggs would you used to say in his great reviews, he would say something foo, like ninja foo. If he'd if he would review a Sam Furstenberg American ninja movie, he'd be like, Michael Dudikoff and Steve James bring the ninja foo. This movie had monster foo. Instead of kung fu, it was monster foo to the nth degree. As a matter of fact, as much as I got, I would have I would have watched a half an hour more monster foo. And this movie, just when it was getting a little too long, it 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 knew when to pull back. And and I, I mean, to quote Spinal Tap, this movie goes to eleven. <laughs> And it just, it gave me exactly what I wanted. And I know people are going to watch this movie and it's not Endgame. It's not a Marvel movie, you know, but, but if, 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 you know, Marvel used to publish a Godzilla comic, they also published Shogun Warriors. They published Micronauts. I mean, this is almost like if somebody adapted <clears throat> a Marvel Godzilla comic from the eighties and put it on screen, I, <laughs> I just, I love this movie so much. Now, um, as many of you know, when I read this before, but uh, I always read people's letters. And part of this, the community we're building here, the post-geek singularity community, uh, what has happened as a result of this community is people are sending me letters at my website, theburnetwork.net. Please go there. And also, these chats are sponsored by Lucky Tiger Men's Grooming Products for those men who want to look good and feel great. And I encourage you to go to their website, getluckytiger.com. And if you go there, like I said, I love their their all-over body wash. I love their facial scrub. I, I love their liquid shaving cream. If you go and buy their products, and I can't recommend them highly enough. A lot of people have been tweeting me who bought their products, how much they like them. If you punch in PGS for Post Geek Singularity Community upon checkout, you get 20% off. But anyway, so uh, I always read letters. And there was one that came in off, uh, around over the transom that I uh, really appreciated. And I'm going to read this. I read it before when I, I, I did a chat on my wrong channel. But uh, this is a quick letter. And it comes in from Ken Dixon. By the way, if you send me a letter at thebrunetwork.net, please tell me at the end if you do want me to read it, if it's okay for me to read it on the air. A lot of people send me letters they don't want me to read on the air. But if you do want me to read it, please tell me. And this letter comes from Ken Dixon. Ken says, hello, Rob. Happy Friday to you and to everyone in the post-geek singularity community. Yesterday, you read a heartfelt letter to which your response was humble, saying, I'm just a guy who likes action figures and movies. You are not just anything. Yes, you like these imagination trinkets and worlds. I do too, as do most who join you in this, our virtual world. That's just it. You've created this space where you share your insight and love for all things geek. You are authentic and passionate about this stuff and engaging to your audience. You claim that this space isn't safe, and I get your intention with that, but I challenge you on this. I've dealt with depression and loss in the past year, and my confidence has been shaken. I join you every day because I experience someone I relate to and who essentially tells me, it's okay for me to be me. It's okay for me to sit in a home office with Star Wars models, action figures, movie posters, the Infinity Gauntlet, etc. It's okay for me to work on a screenplay and submerge myself in imagination. Ultimately, I'm more than okay, and that's due in part to knowing I'm not alone. You are not just anything, so thank you, Ken. Well, no, Ken, thank you. I mean, I get these letters, and I don't even know what to say. I mean, I'm here... We live in a world, as I've said, where there's so much awesome shit coming down the pike all the time. I mean, we got a Shazam movie. We got Endgame. We, I just saw Godzilla, King of the Monsters. We get John Wick 3, Parabellum. Hollywood even allowed somebody to, to call the third movie in their franchise Parabellum. I mean, this is awesome. We live in awesome times, my friend. And if you're a geek, look at the... Look, they just they they just put up for pre-order the Tony Stark, the hot to hot toys 
figure. You know, I love my hot toys. I love my uh, hot toys. Uh, Doctor Strange. They just put up the Tony Stark in his quantum realm suit. It's only 115 bucks for hot toys. That's like a bargain. Anyway, we live in such great times, the current state of Star Trek notwithstanding. But it's awesome where we what we're getting on a daily basis. And why not share all this stuff? While everyone's complaining, look, I'm not saying everything has to be perfect. And there's going to be a lot of people who say, I don't understand, Rob. Why do you love kaiju movies i don't you know they i don't believe them that i can't get into them that's fine you don't have to i'm just here telling you i've loved these movies since i was a little kid and i think they're they're awesome and fun for me i i i really love them and that's not to say like i'm never going to tell you that godzilla's revenge is a great movie i don't like the fact it's basically a godzilla clip show i don't dig it but i like the movie anyway you know Godzilla's kid, when he finally steps on the kid's tail and, and you know, Minya blows out his nuclear fire, I'm like, all right, dude, awesome. I like Godzilla versus Megalon. It's ridiculous. I like Jet, Jet, Jet Jaguar. It's cool, you know, since I was a kid. Do I watch them now? Am I going to get out of, do I like a Godzilla movie the same way I like, say, The English Patient, which, by the way, a movie I like? And yes, Shakespeare and Love deserve the Oscar over Saving Private Ryan. I like these movies. I don't I don't I don't make any bones about it. And and however, you know, even within kaiju films, you can have great kaiju films and not so great kaiju movies. Godzilla versus Mothra, 92, the new continuity. I I teared up. Teared up in that movie. I know I probably shouldn't, but I did. And I think that um so I I I feel like I should qualify my enthusiasm for this movie, even though uh, I don't. I don't have to, but but I, I just want you viewers to know because a lot of people. Here's a problem that I've had my entire life, especially with my male friends. A lot of people don't understand why I genuinely love these things, and uh, some people get mad or jealous or they don't understand. And I remember when I was a kid. Hello, Gilbert. This is Gilbert. Gilbert is here, everybody. For those of you who might be new to the channel. Gilbert is my Bernadoodle. He's he's an alien from the planet Gilbar. He's a Gilbarian. And uh, his superpower is, well, his alien powers of persuasion are ultimately his cuteness. So he will come up, and he is part of the, the team here at uh, the Burnett Work. And he, these aren't his normal cookies. These are actually peanut butter treats. And he gets to come up and be a part of the team because he is, he's kind of like a kaiju. And as a matter of fact, Godzilla in Godzilla King of the Monsters definitely reminded me of Gilbert. That's all you get, buddy. That's too much, dude. That's too much, buddy. You can't eat too many treats. You're going to be hopped up. Yeah. So that's Gilbert. If, if you haven't been to this channel before, he is part of the show. A lot of people, normally he does AMSR video or ASMR videos where he eats his cookies and I can't get enough, especially listening to him crunch on them in my headphones. But anyway, part of the whimsy of the channel. It's Gilbert, and his sister Tallulah is coming soon. She is an Irish doodle. Gilbert is a Bernadoodle. He's about 60 pounds, and he turned uh, 17 months on May 5th. So there you go, May 6th. But anyway, uh, yeah, so there's going to be a lot of people that, that take me to task. But anyway, let's see what you guys have to say at, at 1.15 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, uh, and, and what do you guys have to say? tonight <laughs> uh because i don't know i don't even know i might be in trouble now with with warner brothers or something but let's see uh Bruvies with matt uh, uh <laughs> Bruvies with matt says dude jealous you've seen it set up kk versus gz <laughs> i could do that i might do that uh zach losel is here um, he says, Shalom, Rob, glad to have you on this late, capping off a truly excellent day. I just wanted to let you know that The Wandering Earth is on Netflix. Now, here's the thing. Now, as many of you know, I, I couldn't wait to see The Wandering Earth. Uh, it was this like the second biggest movie, domestic film of all time in China. Now, when I talk about whimsy and, and uh, melodrama in Asian science fiction, I think The Wandering Earth, after I saw it, did I love it? I didn't love it. Uh, it, it was a little too much, I thought. Now, I enjoyed seeing it, especially in the theater. Uh, somebody even recognized me 
<laughs> when I saw it. So I figured, hey, see, I'm not just talking about these things. I really do love them. You can find me in the wild seeing movies like The Wandering Earth, second biggest domestic grocer in China of all time. It's now on Netflix. They quietly dropped it. Netflix picked it up. It's a funny, a funny thing. I mean, I think they think, oh my God, the Chinese market, Wandering Earth loved it. Uh, they loved it there. So Netflix is going to buy it. I think The Wandering Earth is a case where Western audiences are going to be like, what the hell is this? But report back. Everybody should watch it. I know a lot of people can't get through like the first 20 minutes, but you should. You should check it out. <laughs> Johnny West says, working late, Rob. No, dude. No, Johnny. I just came back. The uh, the influencer party that I went to that Mike Doherty had me come to before, they had this influencer party. Warner Brothers and Legendary put it on. Hey, man, free drinks, free food. It was good. Good drinks, good food. So I went to that first, and then we went and watched the lighting ceremony, which I made a video of, uh, the lighting ceremony where they lit up the giant Godzilla that's on the uh, top of the Cinerama Dome in Hollywood. I'll post that video on the channel tomorrow. You can check it out. It's pretty fun. <laughs> so I came back and I said, wow, I'm going to do a live stream at 12. I screwed it up. I put it on the wrong channel. So I'm. this is this is why it's going so late. But um, yeah, I just want to come and talk about, I mean, Gilbert's barking. He doesn't usually bark this late at night because usually I'm asleep with him curled up. But uh, I'm not. <laughs> so I'm here talking to you guys because I wanted to talk about how much I loved Godzilla, King of the Monsters, and how, to be honest, I can't believe it got made. I, I really can't believe it got made. Uh, I'm so happy that it did. Only because, you know, studios, just crazy. <laughs> it just, I can only imagine what they thought <laughs> when they were making this movie. Anthony Gonzalez says, just saw Ellis and Knapsack stand up here in San Francisco, but... In Endgame, I loved seeing Hawkeye in the dark tunnel in the aliens-like scene in Endgame. Yes, Anthony, I thought that was very cool. Definitely inspired by the scene, especially because the red light when, is it Hicks in Aliens when he goes into the ceiling and sees all the aliens on the ceiling? That's, I mean, that's one of the great moments in all of science fiction cinema, I think. Uh, I mean, I, I know, I don't think, but I, I'm just saying my opinion. It's, it's such a great moment. And you know what's funny? Uh, in Aliens, James Cameron only had, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe he only had six alien costumes. There was only six aliens that he had to make that movie. Because um, remember, it was still, I mean, it was it was low, relatively low budget for what it was, which is, is pretty amazing that he made aliens with six full alien costumes because that doesn't always happen. Um Johnny West says, did John curse a lot when his show went blank? <laughs> well, Johnny, yes, it it he did. I when his show just turned off, you know, we we work, I've got as as many people know, I've been upgrading and you'll you'll see a lot more graphics and these shows will be a lot more produced. But I'm just a one man band here. I do everything on my own. It's it's sometimes tough. But you you never know. You hit a button on these switchers and then suddenly you're off the air. But uh, yeah, and I, I just thought it was important that I came in and talked about how much I loved this movie. And and again, if you love giant monster movies, it delivers. It delivers the goods. It really does. Um, Lance Thorne says, man, I'm so worried about the box office for this. I cannot understand how it's tracking so low. Well, you know, here's the thing. A lot of people just don't dig giant monsters. You know, in, in our world, when we get Endgame and Game of Thrones, which are movies about people, or Game of Thrones is, sh is a show, but, you know, again, Americans, Westerners, giant monsters, and kaiju and all that is a different vibe. It's a whole different thing. I mean, like I said, like I tweeted, my eight-year-old self, this was like being Tony Montana at the end of Scarface and sticking, his, sticking my, my eight-year-old face into a giant mountain of cocaine. So not as to piss anyone off. Let's just say it was a giant mountain of cotton candy. My eight-year-old self is snorting this gigantic pile of cocaine or, or cotton candy, whichever you prefer, and just getting on a, a, on a sugar high. Or, or better yet, I just injected myself with a giant syringe of cotton candy. That's what seeing this movie was like for me. 
But then again, you know, I have half a century of loving <laughs> kaiju movies and all that. It was so much fun. But a lot of people are going to watch this and they're just it's just going to be noise to them. And I get it. But let me tell you, if you like this shit, you guys, uh, you're going to dig it. Uh, Fen Wars here. Fen Wars says, and Sigourney Weaver had a nomination for Alien Drop. It's true. It's true. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, Japanese drama clips and OST. Evangelion adaptation would be awesome. I think so, too. I'm, I'm a little upset. For those of you who don't know, Neon Genesis Evangelion is one of the great uh, robot anime animes of all time. It's a great series, but, but they're redubbing it for Netflix, which I don't even understand. It's but if you have never seen Neon Genesis Evangelion, the DVDs have been out of print for a while. A lot of people in the West don't know it. It's going to be on Netflix. Check it out. It's really good. Uh, Rex Racer says Godzilla will probably make a lot of money in the overseas market. Guarantee it's going to make a lot of money in the Asian market. And at this influencer party I was at, there was a lot of of I don't know if they were Asian press, but there was a lot of young hipster, beautiful Asian people there, which was cool. I didn't know if they brought them in from from uh, from China or Korea or wherever, Japan. I know it's screened. I was told it was screened for the Japanese press this morning. So, cool. Uh, Gojira, Godzilla Gojira says or asks, do you think the Godzilla box office will be higher now after it's getting all of these positive reviews? I hope so because it delivers the goods. I mean, if you want to go see an amusement park ride, that'll just make you laugh and scream. And I mean, I love this movie so much. And by the way, you know, I was asking Mike, I was like, are you going to, if you like kaiju movies and you like, say, Mothra or Mosura, there's a song uh, equated with with Mothra. The two little, the cosmos, the princesses sing the Mosura. I can't do it. I can't sing the song. But look it up. Look up Mothra's song on YouTube. You can watch videos for it. Um, Bear McCrary in the end credits of this movie freaking kills it. Brings up the God, the way that Godzilla, the original uh the original godzilla theme is used and the way that the the mothra theme is used especially in the end credits it's so good it's just so good there's so much love in this film i mean i wish you know the funny thing about this is that you can see that mike doherty loved these movies it, it, it permeates every frame he totally gets it everything there's so many things about this so many i'm not going to say what it is but there's a very famous piece of technology <laughs> That that begins with the word oxygen <laughs> in Godzilla movies. They bring this up in this movie, and and I I loved it. And and again, when it comes down to authorship, when you're watching a movie that was created by people who understand, it's like when Ryan Coogler made Creed. I always talk about if you want to point to somebody who knew how to revitalize a moribund franchise or a franchise you thought had no life left in it, look no farther than Ryan Coogler's Creed. What a great way to revitalize a universe. I only wish my beloved Star Trek would have somebody, or it did have somebody, but they were kicked to the curb. But the, the the people who are making Star Trek now have no understanding of Star Trek, nor why people love Star Trek. And it it's frustrating. This movie, like, it took Mike Doherty to make this. Nobody in Hollywood could have made this film. He understands the whimsy. Again, I must show you this print that he made for me. Uh, this is why I got to know Mike Doherty. This is exactly, imagine if you like Halloween and you see this picture, you're like, oh, the man who painted that, which was Mike Doherty, understands what Halloween is, you know? And uh, that's what Godzilla King of the Monsters is. It's a movie that was made by somebody who understands his genre that he's working in. And it was just a delight from that that standpoint. Um, and I I loved it. I, I, I <laughs> Gutspill says, and the font that I said I'd send your way a couple of weeks ago that I forgot to actually do so is the bold font. I don't know if you're saying that to me or not. Uh, the Continental 89 says, Hi, Rob. I'm getting ready for work. I didn't think I'd see you live. <laughs> I just figured, how could I not go live at midnight after I saw this movie? Uh, because I had to talk about it. Because I love it so. Because <laughs> it's great. It's so much fun. And uh, I really dug it so much. Uh, Johnny West says, is there an end credit scene for Kong versus Godzilla? Uh, you know what? I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say what, what I'm not going to say. Anthony Gonzalez says, what we leave behind in theaters Monday, for those of you who don't know, 
uh, Iris Steven Bear's documentary, What We Leave Behind, or What We Left Behind, uh, The Making of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, which I have seen. It's a lovely documentary, really interesting take. Uh, it is a fathom event. It'll be in theaters all across North America on Monday night. I highly recommend it if you're a Star Trek fan and you like Deep Space Nine. It's a uh, it's a very worthwhile documentary, and I would check it out. Uh, it's terrific. Uh, Rex Racer says, "I love the Mothra song." Musura. Me too. How can you not love the Mothra song? <laughs> um. Uh, Matthew Godet says ADV had the rights before they went bye bye. I would assume you're talking about uh, Evangelion. God is in His heaven and is all, all is right with the world. Um, yeah. Um, Doshi says, "Did you like Godzilla more than Endgame?" No, no. But but again, I compartmentalize. You know, I don't. It's weird to me because I don't. You can't. I can't compare the two because the experiences that I've received from those films and where I where I come from where I enter those, those experiences are totally different places. But I would say that for what it was, uh, I enjoyed it immensely. I wouldn't compare it to Endgame because Endgame is a singular experience unto itself, but I really did love this movie. Uh, and I can't, I can't wait to see it again. Uh, I really can't. Uh, uh, a 4K of Aliens without being scrubbed of its film grain will be grainy as hell. Yeah, I mean, you never know. Uh, I don't like it when they scrub film grain because remember, whenever they take grain out of a movie for home video, what they're doing is they're blurring it. They're blurring the film grain. You can't take you can't take the grain out of the original negative if it's there. If you're scanning it digitally and manipulating it, what you're doing is you're blurring it out of existence, and I hate that. Uh, Zach Losel says, that sounds like you had a good time. Ha ha, they were great. I was sitting on the couch right next to the stage. Uh, I don't know what that means. Did you see the movie too? Because that would be great. I would love that. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, what more What more chats are people sending in to me here? Um, Johnny West says, do you think there will be an It Chapter 3? No. <laughs> no because the story ends uh if you haven't read the book which came out in 1986 i read the book i bought the book the day it came out i still have my mint condition uh first edition well i don't know if it's first edition because there were small press editions but i have a first mass market edition of of it in hardcover it's in great condition it's really good um <laughs> matthew got that says last jedi was the last generation screwed up now we pass it on to the new generation to fix the mistakes so the disney characters could take over and the lucas characters exit the saga the problem is those disney characters the new disney characters is just not that interesting um keegan c says hollywood would gladly boycott georgia but not boycott china where they put uh, Uyghur, I can't pronounce that, Uyghur? Or Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps and worst human rights abuses just to make profits full of hypocrites. Well, that that's a little, that gets a little uh, political for me uh, on these chats, but I, you know, I don't necessarily disagree with you, but um, I don't know what kind of change we could affect in China. We can affect far more change here at home if we disagree with something. But uh, yeah. Rex Racer said Tarantino is an awful choice to direct a Star Trek movie. Probably not the best choice. You're probably right about that. Um, but I never want to count Quentin Tarantino out. Um, uh, Zeip uh, Totek says, Mr. Meyer, it's actually Burnett. Meyer's my middle name. But uh, Mr. Meyer, what are your thoughts on Shin Gojira, directed by Hideski uh, Amano? Well, of course, from right Evangelion fame right? Uh, I love Shin Godzilla. <laughs> if you guys haven't seen Shin Godzilla, basically in a nutshell, what if FEMA had to manage a Godzilla attack? It's kind of like that. I loved it. I thought it was great. <laughs> and uh, I love the Blu-ray. Uh, you got to check it out because <laughs> it's good. I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed Shin Godzilla. A lot of people look, if you didn't like Shin Godzilla, I mean, I understand. Oh, uh, Zach Losel says, Shalom again, Rob. I was replying to another imagination connoisseur who also saw Mark Ellis Ken Knapsack live here in San Francisco. Sorry for the confusion. Not at all, man. And I've appreciated your letters, and uh, it's been great uh, having you having you to converse with. 
fantastic, actually. So no, don't please, please don't. Uh, no need to apologize. Um. Uh. Yeah. Anyway, I am. You know, it's funny because I am. Uh, <laughs> I am so tired <laughs> and i'm still you know trying to keep my i'm reading all your messages and i'm trying to keep my enthusiasm up but it's 1 30 in the morning but I, I i've still got some i've still got some time in me so if you have anything you want to say let's see uh matthew Godet says the screenplay was being written by the guy who did the revenant not tarantino oh is that the star trek movie whether or not tarantino ends up directing or producing star trek is anybody's guess i think he would just produce it you know, I don't know. It's there's so much. Hey, Star Trek. Look, as I've said before, they're, they're, Star Trek is violating the Burnett axiom, which is never put your universe before your characters and story, which they're doing. All they're talking about is all these projects that they're developing. Let's see if the Picard series works first. Why not? Why not make a great, non-controversial Star Trek show that's based on real creative vision not a bastardized creative vision of somebody you kicked to the curb and then took their ideas and reworked them in a less good way but that's just me uh von beck 1231 says rmb ever read the elric series by michael moorcock any development stuff in film or television for it i have never read elric i've read i've read other michael moorcock stuff you know like the and, and the final program uh or the last days of man on earth uh, and um, Behold the Man is a Michael Moorcock book I read, which I actually really liked. Uh, it's pretty blasphemous, but but I really liked it. I've never read Elric. I've read some graphic adaptations of it, but never the books. Uh, Charlie Rogers says, I thought Tarantino was officially attached as director to that Star Trek movie. No, he, as far as I know, he hasn't been. So uh, I don't know. Uh, Doshi says, Star Trek is a perfect show, Rob. Just kidding. Doshi, you're on thin ice. Um, Matthew Goddard says, Frank said he would direct Picard in the JJ style. I wish he would direct Picard in the Frakes style. <laughs> um, Nat Murphy says, what are your thoughts on the original Godzilla versus Kong movie? As a kid, I loved the film, but I haven't seen it recently. I was a friend of that goofy Godzilla 2000. I liked Godzilla versus King Kong. I mean, how can you not? It's got, again, crazy, crazy human characters it's it's a crazy movie and again i i liked it but to, like you i haven't seen it in a long time i do have the dvd though i just i haven't watched it in like 20 years i think uh i skip anime opening says go speed racer go speed racer go i love speed racer you know uh some of my favorite episodes of course the mammoth car but i really liked i forget the name of the episode where they go through the volcano I love that. <laughs> um, Tom Bateman says, Rob, do you think a Star Trek show, i.e. Pike, with retro TOS design aesthetic, scripted tight and shot like Mad Men would work? Yeah. But you need somebody who knows and loves Star Trek. You know, you can't hire these people. Everybody they have working on Star Trek, they're not necessarily Star Trek fans, except Kirsten Beyer, who gets marginalized. It was her idea for the Picard series, and basically no one's listening to her. I've heard that writer's room is a nightmare you've got again like with discovery you've got multiple factions there's no real visionary showrunner in charge and um but we'll see hope springs eternal uh anthony gonzalez says i trust lavar's under lavar burton's understanding and direction of star trek the most now that's not bad that could be true uh i don't know uh dax jacobson says oh man star trek discovery is eating my soul well, it's certainly eating my intellect. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, as as you all know, I I, uh, I I can't get enough of Star Trek Discovery because I love. Well, I don't. I you know what? It really doesn't give me much pleasure to bash it all the time. With the amount of money, it's one of the most not just expensive, most expensive Star Trek show ever made. It's one of the most expensive television shows ever made. I mean, it should be much better than it is. Uh, Tim Madone says, Frank Chickens did a version of the Mothra song in the 1980s. The Peanuts were brought out of retirement for the 1984 Godzilla movie, but the song was replaced with the Star Sisters version on video. I know, and I love that. I love it. It's on, that's, you can find that on uh, YouTube. Um, Keegan C says, what is the best written show of all time? 
Oh, that's hard to say because again, it goes down to your taste. I mean, what do you the best sitcom? You know, I, I think we've seen a lot of the best. Some of the best writing is modern, whether it's Sopranos or Breaking Bad or or uh, uh, look, one of my favorite shows of all time is I Claudius. I always think of it as the godfather of television. A lot of people can't watch it today because it was shot on video, but it looks like a soap opera. But I love I Claudius. Um, but there's there's some great, great, great um, television we're getting today. I mean, amazing stuff. I think The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is a wonderfully written show, to be honest. I mean, there's so much good TV now. We live in a golden age of TV. Uh, Nat Murphy says, did you read the Saga comic, and how long do you think it will be until we see it adapted for another media? Are there other sci-fi properties that haven't been exploited for TV or movies? Oh, my God, there's so many. Um, I love the Saga comic. You know what else I like? Uh, just because I, I, I haven't cracked it open, but I'm a huge, huge fan of, of like, Brian K. Vaughn does not need any more um, promotion because he's great. But if you guys haven't read this, if you haven't read Paper Girls... Uh, this is the new hardcover version. It's volume two. Uh, I don't buy single issues anymore. I only buy hardcovers, but I just got this. Uh, I love Paper Girls. If you want to read a great comic, Paper Girls is a great comic. And who doesn't love Brian K. Vaughn? So anyway, I would check that out. But there's so many things that, that look, one of the things that it's not genre, but one of the things I most want to see adapted to the screen, you know, with like a screenplay by, I don't know, Steve Zalian, or, or uh, I don't know, pick your pick your person, but is Donna Tartt's The Secret History, one of my favorite books I've read in a long time, maybe ever. I'd love to see The Secret History adapted into a movie. If you haven't read The Secret History, it's a fantastic book. Um, there's another book by a guy named Glenn Duncan called The Last Werewolf, which I believe Ridley Scott's company, uh, Scott Free, bought... Man, if I could direct a movie, I would love to make The Last Werewolf. It's the first of three books, but when I read it, there was only one book. And uh, it's 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 really good. I, I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, Anthony Gonzalez says, the answer to that is True Detective Season 1. I think True Detective Season 1 is extraordinary. I have yet to see True Detective Season 3, which I really want to see. Gilbert, how you doing, buddy? Gilbert, he's, he's like, why are we up? He wants me to come to bed so he can jump in and curl up, but he doesn't understand what I'm doing. Um, oh, don't bark, buddy. It's all good. You shouldn't even be up now. See, uh, the trouble with TV series today is they ultimately disappoint, says Roblex63. Uh, somebody's going to steal your idea, Rob, says Rex Racer. Yeah, probably, but here's the thing. Unfortunately, uh, my career did not leave me as powerful in Hollywood as I probably want. Uh, look, I've worked in development. I worked in physical production at Warner Brothers. I have a lot of experience that isn't reflected on my IMDb page. Uh, if I was given a billion dollars or if I had Megan Ellison or David Ellison money, if I had 500 million that my dad Larry gave me, oh, I would do very well. <laughs> I would go get, I would make a slate of pictures. I'd pick the people I would want to work on them and make them and they would all be great. I'd direct one myself too. Um, Let's see. Matthew Goddard says, The Walking Dead comics were more my thing, not Saga. I cannot review a book I've never read or give an opinion on. Saga's great. I mean, you know, it's gone on for a while, and like everything else, uh, it, it, I think it was better when it first started, but it's still a great comic. Mike Coonrad says, Paper Girls is pretty sweet. If you haven't read BVK's Ex Machina, you should. I loved Ex Machina. Uh, Brian K. Vaughn's Ex Machina. If you haven't read that, it's basically about a politician who's also a superhero i'll leave it at that but it's great really really good um let's see uh <laughs> fenwar says rob i claudius was game of thrones without the dragons or magic that is pretty astute uh even though it's based in on what really happened it absolutely it absolutely is and uh, i if you guys haven't seen if you like Game of Thrones and you like your political intrigue, I, Claudius, is so great. Now, it's also got some of the greatest actors ever. Patrick Stewart's in it. He plays Sejanus. John Reese davies is in it. Brian Blessed, who played Prince Voltan in Flash Gordon, he's in it. And one of my favorite actresses of all time, Sean Phillips, plays Livia in a performance that is probably the greatest femme fatale 
female villain in television history. Uh, if you don't know who the Sean Phillips is, she played uh, uh, the Reverend Mother uh, Mohiam Mohiam in Dune, in David Lynch's Dune, and she was incredible. Um, let's see. I can barely I can barely see anymore. <laughs> it's tough for me to see. But anyway, uh, there's a lot of people here tonight. Uh, for those of you who are new, who might not know me, please subscribe to the channel if you can. Hit that little ding button. So I go on, I try and go on every day at least once. And for those of you who also don't know, I always read letters in these chats. And you can write me at theburnetwork.net, which is this... YouTube pages website, and there's what's called the Imagination Connoisseur. Everybody who watches this channel is an Imagination Connoisseur. That's what I call my audience, and you're also members of this, the Post Geek Singularity community. If you watch the show and you want to contact me or write me a letter that you want me to read on the air, please go to theburnetwork.net and send me a letter. You can send me letters there, but just remind me if you want me to read your letter on air. I can't read everyone's letters because I'm getting so many now. And, and they, I tend to, I read the letters that come in over the transom that day and pick the ones I think are most pertinent. Um, I'm a little backed up. I've got a lot of letters I'm going to read tomorrow, for instance, over the last couple of days, but please keep writing in, share your enthusiasm. There's also the Imagination Connoisseur Gallery. If you have tattoos, if you have short stories, if you have artwork, if you have pictures of your collection, action figures, your physical media collection, whatever it is you want to share with this, the Post Geek Singularity community, please send it to my website, theburnetwork.net, and we'll put it up. And uh, it's been it's been cool. We're getting a lot of stuff uh, down the transom. So I, I think that, uh, it, you know, it's been great. And building this community, having people here, I can't believe it's, it's, it's 1.43 in the morning and there's 328 of you here. My God, thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. And thanks for supporting the channel. Um, I really appreciate that. But listen, everyone, I think, let me make sure I haven't missed any of your super chats before I turn in because I have to go to bed. I can barely see straight. Uh, I think I got them all. I'm trying not to miss any super chats, and I really appreciate when people send in super chats to support the channel. So everyone, I'm going to bring this chat to a close but i just want to say if you hadn't get, if you didn't get this already man did i love godzilla king of the monsters boy was it fun uh, i'm sure there's going to be many dissenting opinions but for this guy as i said before it made my eight-year-old inner child feel as if i snorted a mountain of tony montana's cocaine <laughs> it was great and I, my friend Mike Doherty, who I've known for years, it was so great to see him, I thought, knock this one out of the park. I hope it propels him into the stratosphere of A-list directors. I can't wait to see what he does next. I know he was tired. He said to me he was very tired after finishing the movie, but I would love to see him make another Godzilla movie right away. <laughs> Let's hope this does well for Legendary. So after Kong, Kong versus Godzilla, they don't retire their monster verse. Because, man, I want to see a Pacific Rim Godzilla movie. That's what I want. That's my dream, Ray Kinsella. That's my dream. <laughs> so anyway, as I always say at the end of these chats, every person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I bid you all a good evening. And I hope to see you later today. And I will be back on the John Campia Show Monday morning at 9 a.m. So thanks very much for watching. I appreciate it. And as always, have a better day. Oh, well, got to turn it off now. <laughs>